In the US, a murder occurs about every 30 minutes, a robbery every one and a half minutes, and a theft every six seconds. So, with millions of crimes committed in the US every year, there have to be some pretty disturbing, strange, and stupid ones. This iceberg was exclusively created by me for this video, has more than 30 entries, and goes from the dumb and racist cops to the very obscure, disturbing, and truly stupid criminals that you would never believe exist. So, I don't want to waste your time anymore, and let's get right into it and start at the tip of the iceberg with Derek Chauvin. Derek Michael Chauvin is a former police officer who murdered George Floyd, a 46-year-old African-American man, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. On May 25, 2020, Chauvin knelt on Floyd's neck for over 9 minutes while Floyd was handcuffed and lying face down on the street calling out I can't breathe during an arrest made with three officers. Chauvin was dismissed by the Minneapolis Police Department on May 26 and arrested on May 29. The murder set off a series of protests across the rest of the United States, later spreading around the world. Chauvin was a member of the police department for more than 19 years and in his career he had 18 complaints against him in his official record. He was on trial for second degree murder, third degree murder and second degree manslaughter of Floyd. And on April 20, 2021, he was convicted on all of these charges. Did you ever feel that keeping your mouth shut would have been the better option after a deep conversation? Well, Greg Abbott is just a prime example of that, even though he was lucky and got away with it because the 27 year veteran of the force requested immediate retirement. But let's go back to how things started. There's not much known about Greg Abbott, only that he went to Reinhardt University and studied organizational leadership and management there. However, what he's also most known for is his racist comment which nearly cost him his job. You're not black. Remember, we only kill black people. Yeah, we only kill black people, right? All the videos you've seen, have you seen any black people get killed? Though the comment appeared to be an attempt at humor or reassurance, the public thinks of it more as highlighting racial stereotypes and biases that persist in our communities and especially in law enforcement. Now we're getting to more of an amusing criminal, dubbed Edward Scissorhands. Several neighbors have caught him on their home surveillance videos, normally out around 3am with a dog off its leash. He starts trimming the tree and admiring his work and kind of stepping back, is what one of the neighbors said. We really just want him to stop doing this. Overnight about a dozen trees on three different streets were hit. We are all liable for those trees per our HOA, so if something happens to the tree, everybody is paying hundreds of dollars per tree to replace them. Residents said police reports have been filed. It still remains a mystery why this petty criminal just randomly cuts his neighbor's trees, but it surely is weird. There are some pretty dumb burglars out there, but this trio may just make it to the top of them. In a turn of events in Florida, a group of burglars made a huge mistake by snorting what they thought was cocaine or heroin, only to discover later that they had actually ingested the cremated remains of a man and two dogs. The incident unfolded in Silver Springs Shores when the thieves targeted a woman's home on December 15, escaping not only with electronic gadgets and valuable jewelry, but also with urns containing the ashes of her deceased father and two Great Danes. Law enforcement officials from the Marion County Sheriff's Office were left speechless when they came to hear the truth behind the stolen ashes after questioning five teenagers in connection with a separate burglary attempt nearby. According to the sheriff's report, the suspects, in a wrong assumption, mistook the ashes for drugs, leading them to snort a portion of the remains. Realization struck them once they became aware of their error. Allegedly, they discussed returning the remaining ashes, but ultimately decided against it, opting instead to dispose of them in a nearby lake, under the presumption that their fingerprints might be traced on the containers. Efforts to recover the lost ashes were launched by police divers, while the suspects found themselves locked facing multiple charges, including burglary. I think we've all heard of this guy, which is why I decided to put him on the top of the iceberg. Tristan Heidel's attempted bank robbery in Huron, Ohio took an unexpected turn when he became trapped in a recycling bin during his escape. This happened in the early hours of the morning, triggering an alarm response from the Huron Police Department at the Vacationland Federal Credit Union. Upon their arrival, officers detected suspicious sounds coming from the roof above the bank's drive through area, so they decided to investigate further. To their surprise, they discovered a blue recycling bin strategically positioned directly beneath the source of the noise. The body camera footage captured everything as law enforcement personnel patiently waited for the suspect, later identified as Tristan Heidel, age 27, to descend from the roof. 
In interviews following his arrest, Heidel confessed to his bad financial situation, claiming he was broke at the time of the crime. Further investigation revealed that Heidel had employed the recycling bin as a temporary platform to gain access to the bank through the roof access door. Charges were quickly filed against Heidel, including breaking and entering, possession of criminal tools and safe cracking. Despite being released on a $50,000 bond, his legal journey was far from over, as his case was scheduled to proceed to a grand jury in the Erie County Common Pleas Court. This man had quite a strange plan. In a bizarre smuggling attempt at JFK Airport, he was caught trying to transport 29 live finches concealed within hair rollers. The individual, a 26-year-old from Georgetown, Guyana, was on the way to New Jersey when US Customs and Border Protection officials discovered the birds during a routine luggage inspection. While the perpetrator avoided criminal charges, he was slapped with a $300 fine. The peculiar incident isn't the first of its kind. A similar effort was made in 2018 by another individual attempting to smuggle a whopping 70 finches through the same airport, only to meet the same fate at the hands of CBP officers. Authorities take this issue seriously due to the potential threat of avian flu. The spread of such diseases can have devastating consequences. Now we're already at tier 2, starting with Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy was a famous serial killer, active during the 1970s. He is known for his heinous crimes, which included kidnapping, sexually assaulting and murdering numerous young women across five different states. Ted Bundy's story continues to horrify people even decades after his reign of terror. Despite his continuous planning, his eventual downfall was created by a series of reckless decisions and sheer stupidity that ultimately led to his capture. Bundy's ability to evade law enforcement for so long mainly came from his charm, intelligence and the calculated manner in which he chose his victims. His crime spanned multiple states, leaving little evidence behind and confounding investigators at every turn. However, beneath his carefully crafted facade is a man prone to panic and impulsive actions when faced with unexpected situations. One such instance occurred on August 16th, 1975. When Bondi's carefully laid plans were nearly foiled by a routine patrol car passing by. Instead of maintaining his composure and continuing with his reconnaissance, Bundy panicked and hastily fled the scene at high speed. Little did he know that the patrol car was merely on a routine patrol and not actively pursuing him. In his attempt to escape, Bundy made a critical error by leaving evidence in plain sight within his vehicle. When the police officer pulled him over and discovered items such as handcuffs, trash bags, an ice pick, a crowbar, rope and a she mask made out of pantyhose, Bundy's weak attempt at explanation only served to further incriminate him. His claim that the ski mask was for skiing purposes was as absurd as it was transparently false. The incompetence shown by Bundy at the moment didn't compare at all with the calculated precision he had in carrying out his crimes. The guy who I like to call the burger man is a man who broke into a Five Guys just to make himself some burgers. On December 26, 2016, an unknown man sneaked into a restaurant behind a delivery driver. The hungry thief waited for the place to close and then helped himself to some free burgers and a bottle of water. We still don't know who exactly the burger man is, however, from the footage it looks like he made at least one double cheeseburger. In 2006, a failed bank robbery in Troy, Michigan got attention when the would-be robber, Lawrence C. Lawson, revealed his unsuitability for a life of crime. Lawson, an unemployed automotive designer, entered the LaSalle Bank on Maple Road, armed with a loaded .357 caliber Smith & Wesson handgun and presented a note indicating his intent to rob the bank. However, as he attempted to make his escape with cash in hand, he suddenly fainted when spotting two police cars passing by. Lawson's collapse caught the attention of bank employees, who promptly dialed 911. Troy Police Lieutenant Gary Sherling noted the coincidence of the police presence, emphasizing that Lawson's fainting spell occurred just as the patrol cars happened to be driving by. Lawson, 60 years old and originating from Madison Heights, was subsequently taken into custody and charged with bank robbery and possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony. Further investigation revealed that Lawson suffered from a medical condition that made fainting likely. Officers transported him to a medical center where he was evaluated for two hours before being released back into police custody. Despite his lack of a prior criminal record, Lawson faced serious charges that could result in substantial prison time, including a potential life sentence for the bank robbery charge and a mandatory two-year sentence for firearm possession. Lawson's motive for the attempted robbery came from his financial situation. Unemployed since November, and struggling to find employment, he resorted to desperate measures as bills piled up. 
I don't really know if I should call this dumb or just well behaved. On July 4th, 2019, Stephen Raham, a 45-year-old inmate at the Humphreys County Jail, managed to escape from custody, creating a brief period of concern for law enforcement. Ham, who was detained for charges including theft of property, burglary of a motor vehicle, failure to appear and failure to pay child support, evaded authorities for approximately 7 hours before voluntarily returning to the jail around 3 a.m. on July 5th. Details regarding Ham's escape remain unclear, leaving unanswered questions about how he managed to break free from custody. The incident involving Darren Wilson and Michael Brown occurred on August 9, 2014 in Ferguson, Missouri. Darren Wilson, who was a police officer at the time, encountered Michael Brown, an 18-year-old African-American, on the street. Accounts of what exactly happened during the encounter vary, but it is widely reported that Wilson stopped Brown and a friend, Dorian Johnson, and because they were walking in the middle of the street and matched a description of suspects involved in a convenience robbery that occurred earlier. According to Wilson's testimony and other witness accounts, there was a physical altercation between Wilson and Brown at the police car window. Wilson stated that Brown attempted to grab his gun during the struggle. Wilson then fired his weapon, hitting Brown. Brown then fled the scene and Wilson pursued him. What happened next is highly contested. Wilson claimed that Brown turned back and charged at him, prompting Wilson to fire several more shots ultimately killing Brown. However, some eyewitnesses provided conflicting testimonies, alleging that Brown had his hands up in surrender when he was shot, a gesture that became symbolic in the subsequent protests with the slogan, hands up, don't shoot. After the shooting, there were protests in Ferguson and across the United States, with many demonstrators demanding justice for Michael Brown and calling attention to broader issues of police brutality and systemic racism in law enforcement. Samuel Brown, a 33-year-old resident of San Diego, made headlines for his bank robbery which he committed at the Chase Bank branch in Fountain Valley, California. Brown's criminal activities began when he successfully robbed the bank by passing a stick-up note to a teller at around 3 p.m. on a Monday afternoon, escaping with a substantial amount of cash. However, what set his case apart was his bold decision to return to the same bank just the following morning to attempt another robbery. This time, his luck ran out as the authorities already knew of his previous day's exploit. Police responded promptly to the scene of the Brown's reappearance and without much resistance, they were able to arrest him around 11.15 am. It was revealed that Brown had an outstanding arrest warrant and a criminal history that included prior convictions for robbery in San Diego. He was detained in Orange County Jail with bail set to $170,000. He faces multiple robbery charges adding to his already extensive rap sheet. Clint Butler, a 36-year-old British man, had been on the run after escaping from jail in November, evading police for months. However, his luck ran out when he made a crucial mistake. He went out of his hiding place to purchase a copy of the video game Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, as reported by the West Midlands Police. Butler was arrested on January 13th in Birmingham. Police officers became suspicious when Butler and a companion changed direction as they spotted police. When questioned about their presence in town during a pandemic lockdown, Butler's friend casually explained that they were there to purchase the new Call of Duty game. Despite attempting to conceal his identity and admitting to possessing marijuana, Butler's attempt to deceive the police failed. When informed that the information would be checked, Butler, apparently confusing the video game with reality, launched an assault on the officers, resorting to physical beatings and kicks. So Butler's excursion for a video game led to his capture, pretty dumb if you ask me. The Rodney King incident is a pretty famous case of police brutality that occurred in Los Angeles, California in 1991. Rodney King, an African-American man, was brutally beaten by several police officers from the Los Angeles Police Department following a high-speed car chase. The incident was captured on video by a bystander and subsequently broadcast widely, creating outrage across the nation. The actions of the police officers involved were highly inappropriate and unjust. The video footage showed King being repeatedly struck with batons and kicked by several officers, despite him appearing to pose no immediate threat. The excessive and unjustified use of force by law enforcement officers, particularly against a black man, showed the issue of racism and police brutality within the LAPD and law enforcement agencies more broadly. What made the situation really egregious was not only the violence inflicted upon Rodney King, but also the subsequent handling of the case. Despite clear video evidence of the officers' actions, a jury acquitted the officers involved in King's beating, leading again to widespread protests in Los Angeles in 1992. And again, the justice system failed to hold the responsible officers accountable for their actions. On January 6, 1995, MacArthur Wheeler and Clifton Earl Johnson carried out armed robberies at two banks in Greater Pittsburgh. Surprisingly, they made no effort to disguise themselves. 
Instead, they covered their faces with lemon juice under the belief that it would make them invisible to security cameras. How did they get this stupid idea? Their reasoning came from the misconception that lemon juice could function like invisible ink. Wheeler and Johnson's lack of understanding was further evident in Wheeler's attempt to test the effectiveness of the lemon juice disguise. He photographed his face covered in lemon juice with a Polaroid camera, believing that his absence from the resulting image proved the method's efficacy. Detectives later speculated that his absence in the photograph could be attributed to factors such as bad film or misaligned camera, rather than the supposed invisibility of lemon juice. As a result, of their unconventional approach, Johnson was arrested a few days after the robberies, while Wheeler was identified in surveillance footage and arrested several months later. After seeing the incriminating photographs, Wheeler expressed disbelief, insisting that he had worn the lemon juice as planned. Both perpetrators received lengthy prison sentences for their crimes. Johnson, who pleaded guilty to the bank robbery and unrelated offenses, was sentenced to 5 years in prison. Wheeler, convicted for his involvement in one of the robberies, received a 24 and a half year prison sentence. By the way, the absurdity of Wheeler and Johnson's action caught the attention of social psychologist David Dunning, who, along with his graduate student Justin Kruger, investigated the case. This incident ultimately led to the development of the Dunning-Kruger effect, a psychological phenomenon where individuals with limited ability in a specific domain mistakenly think of of the competence as higher than it truly is. In 2006, Edward Ades, a Florida resident, found himself in a murder case accusing him of fatally shooting his former son-in-law. His defense team opted for an unusual strategy, contending that Ades, who weighed nearly 300 pounds and struggled with mobility issues, couldn't have committed the crime due to his physical limitations. However, this defense quickly crumbled under the weight of contrary evidence. It turned out that Ades possessed military experience, raising questions about his ability to handle firearms despite his weight. Furthermore, investigators uncovered unsettling details such as Ades' recent online searches about methods of killing people creating doubt on his innocence. Relatives of Ades were found to have provided false alibis, further undermining his defense. Despite the attempt to use his obesity as an alibi, the evidence pointed convincingly towards Ada's fault in the murder. In Canton, Ohio, Stacy Stedman was woken from her sleep one morning to discover an uninvited guest snoozing in her guest bedroom. And this uninvited visitor wasn't just any late night wanderer. He was a burglar who had apparently helped himself to some bizarre things in the Stedman household. According to reports, the intruder had made himself right at home. Not only had he broken in overnight, but he had also indulged in a swim in the family's outdoor pool. As if that weren't audacious enough, he proceeded to raid their fridge, finishing off what was left of the family's chicken dinner from the night before. To add insult to injury, he even took the liberty of lighting a candle in the bathroom, as if to set a cozy atmosphere for his stay. Just like an Airbnb guest, Stedman, understandably concerned for her family's safety, quickly alerted her brother-in-law, Brian Pearson, who promptly sprang into action to confront the unwelcome intruder. Fortunately, the sleepy burglar was quickly chased out of the house. However, the disturbances didn't end there. Upon closer inspection, Stedman discovered more evidence of the intruder's activities. Not only had he left behind her sweat trousers by the poolside, but he had also brazenly stolen a pair of her son's underwear before making his exit. All this left the Stedman family shaken and unsettled, particularly since they had considered their home safe for over a decade. Police arrived on the scene and arrested the trespasser, suspecting that he may have been under the influence of alcohol or drugs. Now on to tier 4, we're starting with Frank Chicane's assassination attempt. During the era of two in South Africa, the regime's actions extended beyond racial segregation and oppression to include absurd attempts at silencing its critics through chemical substances. One particularly ridiculous example of the incompetence of the government involved Frank Chicane. The defense force wanted Chicane's demise, but wanted to avoid fallout of a direct assassination. The solution proposed by RRL scientists was to poison Chicane while he was abroad in Namibia. Rather than choosing a discreet method such as slipping poison into Chicane's meal or administering it through covert injection, the would-be assassin settled on a quite weird approach, spreading poison on five pairs of Chicane's underwear. This decision proved to be their downfall. The chosen poison Peroxane required a sufficient dose to come into contact with Chicane to be lethal. Unfortunately for the plotters, underwear covered too small an area for the poison to have the desired effect. Dennis Nilsson is a Scottish serial killer who mainly committed his crimes in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Convicted in 1983, Nilsson was found guilty of the murders of six young men, although it's suspected that his actual victim count may have been as high as 15. 
His approach was very methodical. He would lure his victims to his home where he would then strangle them or drown them. However, what set Nilsen apart from other killers was the horrible way in which he handled his victims' bodies. After killing them, he would retain their corpses in his residence for long periods, sometimes for weeks or even months, before proceeding to dismember them. He did a lot of gruesome acts which I don't even want to talk about in favor of your mental health. Nilsen's method of disposing of the bodies also was disturbing. While some body parts were discarded near his house, others, notably smaller fragments, were flushed down the toilet. This stupid practice is what got him exposed. In early 1983, a series of plumbing issues led to calls for a local plumber from both Nilsen himself and his neighbors. Upon expecting the drain, the plumber made a creepy discovery. It was clogged with small bones. Alarmed, the plumber called the authorities. When the police arrived at Nilsen's residence, they were met with an unmistakable stench. Nilsen seemingly resigned to his fate, confessed to his crimes relatively quickly. Shockingly, he even directed the officers to the location of a body that still remained in his home at the time of their arrival. He was convicted and sentenced to life in prison with a recommendation that he serve a minimum of 25 years. He spent the remainder of his life behind bars, dying in prison at the age of 72 in 2018. In the Bronx, an incident happened as captured in a video, where a man swinging a knife stabbed another person during a fight multiple times in the back. The whole crime occurred around 1.15 am, in front of Keenan's bar and grill on Broadway in Kingsbridge. The attacker, described as a bearded man in his mid to late 20s with two tattoos on his right arm, approached a 35 year old victim and repeatedly stabbed him in the back and left arm, almost severing a finger on his hand in the process. After the assault, he fled south on Broadway while the injured victim was transported to a nearby hospital in stable condition. It still remains unclear why the suspect stabbed the man. In the 2013 murder case against Alan Benkowski, the evidence against him was pretty straightforward. Bloodstains on his shoes, his frequent presence in the area of the crime and his familiarity with the murder weapon, a hammer, pointed strongly towards his guilt. However, his defense strategy was both bizarre and ineffective. Bienkowski's alibi was centered around his claim that he was occupied with heroin use throughout the day of the murder. He described the day that began with him using heroin at 5.30 am, checking on a vending machine, walking his dog and seeking out more heroin. Additionally, he mentioned planning or attempting suicide multiple times in the days leading up to the murder. This alibi not only involved admitting to additional illegal activities, but also failed to contradict the actual evidence against him in the murder case. Rather than providing an alternative explanation for his actions, Bienkowski's defense only added to the confusion and failed to cast doubt on his guilt. On to tier 5, we start with Dennis Radar. This case is a pretty stupid one. Dennis Radar, aka the BTK killer, was an American serial killer who between 1974 and 1991 killed 10 people in the Wichita, Kansas area. Radar sent taunting letters to police and newspapers describing the details of his crimes. He became so confident in talking to the media that he would even denounce claims that some kills weren't his and were actually a copycat. 30 years after the first string of murders began, the case was considered too cold. With no real leads and not enough evidence, they were afraid that the BTK killer had escaped their grasp. That is until he started mailing letters to them again. Wanting to keep up the conversation in the new era, Dennis asked the investigators if sending information through a floppy disk could be traced, much like grandpa not knowing how the internet works. The investigators were surprised by the question and responded that he could send that in and not be found. Dennis Radar was soon arrested after authorities used the floppy disk to trace him back to his his home. From there, the amount of evidence was monumental. When arrested, he was curious how he had been found. When it was revealed that it was the floppy disk, Dennis Rader said, but I thought you said you couldn't trace those. Why would you lie? Appearing to be completely surprised that law enforcement would cheat to catch him. Surprised by his weird morals, the detective responded, because you were hurting people. He didn't understand. Khaled Michal was a rising figure in Hamas in 1997, but was not yet at the top of leadership. Nevertheless, his activities in the organization made him a prime target for assassination by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who was then serving his first term in the premiership. Indeed, Netanyahu wanted Michal targeted even before more prominent Hamas members, but the scheme that was built to kill Michal left something to be desired. The plan was to intercept Michal while he was in Jordan. One agent would draw his attention by making a mess with a shaken can of soda, while another would approach Marshall and shoot poison into his ear with what was effectively a covered squirt gun, and evaporated so quickly that it would never be detected. 
that Israeli agents had a proven track record of efficiently killing Hamas targets with snipers was completely overlooked. Technically, the plan almost worked. Mashal was poisoned and he came within hours of death. But the Israeli agents were caught in the act, revealing the plot. The attempted assassination on foreign soil led King Hussein of Jordan to personally demand Netanyahu provide the antidote and release Palestinian prisoners as recompense, with no way to mitigate the international humiliation. Serial killer Joel Rifkin was arrested in 1993 and it is believed he committed as many as 17 murders. Rifkin was only convicted of 9 murders, but he did get 203 years in prison for it. Rifkin had any particular MO that saw him picking up prostitutes, usually having sex with them and then killing them during or after the act. He would often put the bodies in barrels or buckets and tie them in rivers all around the New York, New Jersey area. Some of his victims were dismembered and some have never been identified. It was in June 1993, after Rifkin had killed his final victim, that the police finally caught up with him. However, it wasn't for the reasons you might think. State troopers saw Rifkin's truck drive by and noticed that it didn't have a license plate. They were going to pull him over to give him a ticket, but he ignored the lights and kept driving. Even with the sirens on, Rifkin refused to pull over in an attempt to elude him. He drove right into a light pole. The police, who were right behind him, immediately handcuffed him as he got out of his truck and noticed right away the smell of a dead body. His final victim, Tiffany Bresciani, had been killed three days earlier and was in the back of his truck. He confessed to the murder right away and soon confessed to many more, if not for a missing license plate. He may have continued for many years. This one might hurt you a bit. Cameron Jeffrey Wilson, 27, made headlines when he accidentally shot himself in the testicles while carrying a gun in his front pocket on April 5 in Washington state. The firearm discharged accidentally, with the bullet piercing his testicles and then lodging into his thigh. Wilson was rushed to the hospital for treatment when something bizarre was discovered. During surgery to address the gunshot wound, a surprising discovery was made. A balloon filled with marijuana slipped out of Wilson's anus. This unexpected finding raised eyebrows and led to further investigation. Subsequently, when police searched Wilson's car, they uncovered a bag of methamphetamine, adding to the complexity of the situation. As Wilson was being processed into the Chelan County Jail, Authorities conducted a strip search, during which yet another balloon filled with marijuana came out of him, giving him his status as a convicted felon. Wilson faced a series of charges including second degree felon in possession of a firearm, unlawful possession of methamphetamine and possession of a controlled substance in a correctional facility. David Berkowitz, better known as the Son of Sam, terrorized New York in the late 1970s. The high-profile serial killings were heavily featured in the media and the killer continued his spree despite the police's best efforts for months. Berkowitz managed to elude capture despite being the subject of what was the largest manhunt in New York City police history. He killed six people and wounded many others and even sent letters to the police taunting them for their inability to catch him. That Berkowitz couldn't stop harassing people is what ended up getting him caught. He would send his neighbors anonymous letters that were unsettling and threatening. Police eventually began to find a pattern and identified Berkowitz as a suspect. Once they did so, they were able to discover that Berkowitz had been using his own car as a getaway vehicle after each murder. When they cross-referenced parking tickets on the night of the last murder, Berkowitz's car was there and had been ticketed. If not for his need to harass people and his laziness when it came to parking his own car that was registered to his name, he might have continued his murders for an indefinite amount of time. Finally, at the last tier, you can find Ricky Simon Sr. It was back in 2008 when 22-year-old Jamie Fraley went missing. Police were interested in speaking to a man named Ricky Simon Sr. about her disappearance. Jamie's mother believed that Simons knew what happened to her daughter as the 49-year-old man was the last person to see her alive as far as anyone knows. He was a person of interest and very likely would have been questioned by the police regarding Freddy's disappearance. However, Simons threw a wrench into the works. Before Simons could be questioned regarding the disappearance, he was found dead in the trunk of a car. A world like that it sounds like perhaps somebody had killed him to cover up a bigger crime, but that's not actually what seems to have happened. The trunk Simons was found in belonged to his ex-girlfriend. She was the one who discovered him there and was as surprised as anyone. As far as the police were able to figure out, Simons had actually hidden in the trunk with the intention of killing his ex-girlfriend. However, he got locked inside and died from the heat. In an extra bit of weirdness, it turns out that Simons was also the father of Riley's fiance. The younger Simons also believes his father had a hand in the disappearance of his fiance, but this mystery may never be solved. This one is pretty disgusting. 
Let's say you've been caught at the scene of a murder. You have blood on you and all signs point to you having done the killing. How would you get out of it? Whatever you'd say, it probably wouldn't be as horrifying as what Mark Dixie said when he was caught in a similar situation. Sally Ann Bowman was murdered in 2015, stabbed and bitten outside her home and her body showed signs that she had been raped. DNA evidence as well as bloody fingerprint and bite patterns led police to a chef named Mark Dixie. Dixie did admit he'd committed a crime, but not murder. Instead, he said that he'd been drinking and taking drugs and that he'd stumbled upon the body during a walk. He admitted that he did the act with the body when he found it. He explained he didn't actually kill Bowman. Horrified, the jury still found him guilty and sentenced him to life in prison.